Okay, well, it is recording right now. Okay. So I guess we will start. Hello, everybody. How is everybody doing? Can you hear me? Okay, we see Dr. Ayala already making her comments. So, um, wow, what a pleasure it's going to be to introduce you, uh, Dr. Orozco, who just received the uh, award for the best book for Texas women's uh, history from the Texas Tech Historical Association. So on behalf of everybody, Dr. Orozco, I'm going to applaud you. <laughs> Thank wow, you. that's an excellent accolade. Thank um, you very much. <laughs> so my name is Diana Cordova and I am the Director of Multicultural Affairs. And I know it says underneath Annabel, but I'm using her computer. So, um, but I'm Diana. And I have the pleasure to introduce you Dr. Cynthia Orozco, who um, is a professor of humanities and history in ENMU Ridoso. And she's going to be talking about her book, which just received an award. Was it on Saturday, Dr. Rothko? Yes. Okay. Well, good memory then. <laughs> and she's going to be talking about um, Adela Sloss Vento, who was a pioneer. I mean, she was an activist, a Latina activist. And um, so just a reminder, you can chat. And also there will be a survey after uh, Dr. Orozco's presentation, and it takes a few minutes, please do it because we like to know how we're doing, what would you like to see? And I'm just going to let Dr. Orozco take it away. Thank you, Dr. Orozco. And okay. Wait. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be with you folks at ENMU and Portales, and I hope we have some folks from ENMU Redoso and maybe Roswell as well. Today, I'm going to talk about a woman who is virtually unknown to the majority of Americans. Her name uh, is Adela Sloss Bento. Sloss is actually a German name, and Bento is actually an Italian name, which tells us that she did live along the US Mexico border in South Texas, but uh, her parents, uh, or descendants rather, were of German descent, and uh, her husband's. Uh, descendants were of Italian descent. Nonetheless, she very much lived the life of a Mexican-American woman. Uh, while she was a Tejana, she's now deceased. She lived from 1901 to about 1998. While she's now deceased uh, and unknown in Texas, she of course is even less known in New Mexico and throughout the United States. I will uh, discuss a little bit about New Mexico parallels. Uh, I'm sure that most of you know more about New Mexican history than Texas history, so I'll try to make her uh, put her in a broader context uh, for those people from New Mexico as well. Okay, so I'm going to talk about her in a number of ways. I'm going to talk about her as a feminist, as a civil rights leader, as a Democrat with a large D, and as a public intellectual. And I'm going to be talking about her also with regards to a couple of uh, major ideas or concepts that I will explain and, and elaborate on a little bit uh, throughout my talk. Uh, some of those ideas or concepts involve the idea of homo sociality, and that's the idea of uh, women with women, uh, men with men, uh, not in the sexual sense, but in the social sense, or even in political activity, civic engagement. Uh, also, I'm going to make reference to something called modern gender selfhood, which is the idea, especially after 1920, when women in the United States earned the vote, earned suffrage, uh, that more so after 1920, we began to see more women uh, taking on careers, uh, thinking more about themselves as individuals instead of just helping out their families, particularly in the case of Mexican-American women. Uh, and also a, a third idea is that of what we call third space feminism. And here we have the idea that while people like Adela Slavs Bento worked in nationalist or ethnically based social movements or civil rights movements, 
she was still a feminist within that and in addition to that and because of that and so we'll talk about that uh finally the last kind of uh concept or thought i want to uh, talk a little bit about is the idea of gendered ambivalence we know ambivalence is when you're somewhat unsure and i'm going to talk about her as someone who's who has gendered ambivalence meaning that as a writer she was always a little unsure of herself. And again, this is related to her gender and I'll talk a little bit about that. So in order to talk about Adela Slas Bento, we really do first have to talk a little bit about the status of the Mexican descent community in Texas. And again, uh, most of my discussion will be about Texas today. If we were to look at the political status of the Mexican descent community, say the year 1910 or so, we would have found only one person of Mexican descent in the entire Texas state legislature. So that is how racially marginalized the community was there. And think about that in contrast to New Mexico, where we know that one third of the people or the men who wrote the state constitution here in New Mexico were Hispanic. So again, you see the difference uh, in, in political representation in Texas versus New Mexico. Um, also, uh, even throughout the 1920 to 1950 era, there were only three Tejanos men who were in the Texas legislature. And in 1969, there were only 12. So again, you see the political marginalization. If we were to look at the question of the economy and the, and the class location of where most people of Mexican descent in Texas were. In 1930, for example, about half were farm workers. The middle class was tiny. It was emerging a little bit more so after World War I when veterans came back. Uh, Mexican immigration was prominent from 1910 to 1930 because of the Mexican Revolution. Uh, so small businesses, more small businesses started to emerge and that's how our middle class started to emerge. Um, Really, we start to get a true decent middle class really only after the 70s when college is made available because of the pill. If we look at the social status of that same community, that we will see that mostly we had a various serious situation with racial segregation in the schools, uh, in the restaurants, in the hospitals, in the hotels, in so many uh, places of business. Uh, even by 1948, we had 139 different school districts in Texas that still had separate schools for Mexicans. And again, the idea was not so much that it was bad to be with your own kind, but that the funding was less, the uh, school buildings themselves and facilities were inferior, and so it was never set up as separate and equal. Also, if we look at the educational status of the Mexican community in Texas, in 1930, the University of Texas, which is the, the largest and, and, and perhaps most important institution in the state, only had 250 Latinos of any kind for the entire state. In 1946, there were only 114 Tejanos, people of Mexican descent in all Texas colleges. So again, it's really not until after we have the Chicano movement of the late 60s and 70s and financial aid again, uh, that we start to have more meaningful numbers there. So given that a particular picture, we begin to see that Adela Slas Bento is going to be a very unique person working in her time. And again, her life basically spans from around 1901 to 1998. So she would have started to have been a young woman in the 20s and matured, of course, over time. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about her as a feminist. Uh, what we do know is that throughout what we now call the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement in Texas, which we begin to date from 1920 on to the uh, late 60s, uh, again, Mexican American Civil Rights Movement, uh, we know of only two prominent women that were active in this time period, uh, particularly in the LULAC organization. LULAC stands for League of United Latin American Citizens. It is the oldest national Latino civil rights organization in the country. 
Uh, it was founded in 1929, and actually that has been the subject of most of my uh, history work since 1978 when I was a sophomore in college. Um, within the LULAC organization, when it was founded in 1929, it was founded by men for men. And so when it was founded, women's suffrage had already passed, but the Mexican-American man at the time did not realize or did not give importance to the women's political power, the ability to vote. Uh, and so they were initially excluded. Finally, a few years later, they create Ladies LULAC, which is a separate institution inside of LULAC for women. And so you can already begin to see that Mexican-American women were being marginalized in the organization. Adela Slosbento did not join, but she did support uh, Ladies LULAC and she supported LULAC in general. Uh, there was one woman named Alice Dickerson Montemayor from Laredo, who was really the first major feminist in LULAC. She wrote articles. Uh, one of them was called Son Muy Hombres, or They're Very Much Men or Very Macho. And she criticized uh, the sexism in the organization. Uh, but she was active mostly in the late 30s and 40s. And she was kind of seen as an oddball during her time and did not have good support from women or men at the time. Uh, Adela Slos Vento really was an independent woman. She rarely joined organizations, but nonetheless, she was able to do uh, quite a lot. Um, again, um, the people who would have joined Ladies Lulac would have mostly been uh, Mexican American women from the middle class. And again, these would have been clerks, teachers, uh, people who may have had a high school education. Again, if you were somebody who had a high school education before the 19, uh, actually before the 1970s, you would have been an oddity uh, up until the 1950s in Texas, it was not common to see Mexican Americans graduating from high school. It would have been uh, common by the 70s. But anyway, Adela Slos Vento was somebody who graduated from high school in the mid, uh, mid to late 20s. So again, she was unusual as a Mexican American and as a woman. Uh, we also call her a feminist because she wrote a very interesting article in the mid thirties called Why There Is No Happiness in Many Latino Homes. And she, or she talked about uh, the Latino man and she says the Latino man has all the privileges and rights, Spanish customs that have lent themselves to a perpetual chain of suffering. So again, this was very much an early critique way before what we now call the Chicana feminist movement of the late 60s and 70s. Uh, so she wrote a number of essays with regards to women's rights. Uh, we would also call her a civil rights activist and we do so for a number of reasons. First of all, in the 1930s, she was active in a major uh, school desegregation case. She helped to raise funds for something called the De Rio versus Salvatierra case. It's the first class action lawsuit against separate Mexican schools in Texas. But she helped raise funds for this. And this is outside of her community. She mostly lives in San Juan and later Edinburgh, Texas in the Valley. Uh, Del Rio is further west and further north. Uh, she also in the 1940s uh, lobbied against or lobbied rather for a couple of anti-discrimination bills. And again, there would have been uh, one or two uh, Latinos in the Texas legislature, but there were a few white allies. They tried to push through several times anti-discrimination bills without any success. Nonetheless, Adela Slos Vento made, wrote her letters and probably made her phone calls uh, to lobby the state legislators. Also in the 1950s, uh, the Bracero program was going strong. The Bracero program uh, was a program between the United States and Mexico that lasted between 1942 uh, and 1964. And it allowed the US to bring in uh, Mexican workers to pick the crops, uh, to pick the cotton, to pick the apples, apples here in Lincoln County, uh, and to receive minimum wages, but they were feeling a labor shortage because of World War II. Of course, the war, didn't, the war did not last that long, but nonetheless, agribusiness benefited. So 
the program stayed in place. She was very critical of the uh, exploitation of the braceros who were often fed very poorly, poorly housed, if at all housed, uh, poorly clothed and had very little money. And she talked about them receiving um, starvation wages and being uh, subjected to cheap, uh, subjected as cheap labor. She also in the 1950s wrote against a pamphlet or a booklet that the University of Texas uh, Press, University of Texas at Austin published rather, and it was called The Wetback in the Lower Rio Grande. Okay, and obviously uh, today <laughs> we don't use the word wetback. I hope we still not using that word, but it was a reference to undocumented Mexican workers who supposedly swam or walked over the river. Even the US federal government helped to institutionalize that racial slur because they had something called the wetback program to try to deport some of these folks who had come in the early 50s. Well, the university published a, a pamphlet. There were a number of, of interviews that were conducted and the edit editorial job was very bad. Uh, and as a result, it looks like the University of Texas was saying that the wetbacks were dirty, the women had lies, and that they were unwanted people. Obviously, it put a bad image on all the Latinos that were in Texas, and Adelos Los Bento attended a major conference to protest and condemn that particular pamphlet. Uh, another interesting thing about her is not only was she in what we call the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement, again, which we date 1920 to the late 60s. She was also a participant of what we call the Chicano movement, which is a separate movement from the late 60s to the end of the 70s. And this is one where we see young people are rebelling. Uh, we associate it with the student movement, with the anti-war movement. Uh, the Mexican American community is also uh, impacted by the black power movement. So, in Texas, the Chicano movement, which was also here in New Mexico, by the way, uh, she favored the Raza Unida Party, which was also here in New Mexico. The Raza Unida Party uh, was a separate third party, and it was protesting both the Democrats and Republicans for not doing anything for the Hispanic community. Also, she favored the United Farm Workers and the Texas Farm Workers. And again, uh, we saw the beginning rise of Cesar Chavez and farm workers movements uh, beginning in the early 60s. Uh, she also argued in favor of students who walked out in several schools in the late 60s in the Valley in a place called Elsa Ed Count. She supported the student uh, walkout. They were fighting for Mexican American studies. They were also fighting for the right not to be punished for speaking Spanish on campus. And she also fought for, or favored rather, Chicano studies at universities. And again, today, all the major universities typically have Chicano studies. Some, like my own, are quite small. We don't really offer that. It's a separate offering. Uh, but hopefully by now, we have integration of Chicano history into our US history classes. Uh, she also uh, favored uh, the Spanish language. By the 1970s, assimilation was a major problem in our community, and she argued for its validity and, and beauty. Um, also, as a writer, uh, she also advocated for civil rights in writing. For example, she wrote in 1947 an article in the McAllen Monitor, Can We Afford Cheap Labor? And that was the title. And she answered no. We cannot afford cheap labor. It does not pay in the long run. Cheap labor run, ruins the health of workers of their wives and children. It deprives the children from obtaining an education. Uh, so again, we can see that uh, she is very uh, uh, not liking cheap labor. Again, uh, that's the same issue. And today we've got discussions about the minimum wage, uh, whether $15 is too much. Uh, she would have said that, no, we cannot afford um, the cheap minimum wage. Uh, she also wrote against the wetback pamphlet. Uh, again, here's uh, a comment uh, uh, made during an interview in the wetback pamphlet. About 80% of them have lice in their hair. The women especially, they believe that lice helps them to have babies. Again, so we can see the overt racism and sexism of the time. 
And in 1968, when she was writing in favor of the student protesters, she said students protested against the discrimination for speaking Spanish on, on the campus, as well as for their demands to have a course taught in said schools related to the contribution of Mexicans and Mexican Americans in the state and region, region, including factual account of the history of the Southwest and the culture and history of Mexico. Okay, so you can see that she was very much a pan, what we would call a Pan-Americanist as well. Um, we also call her a public intellectual. And basically what she did from 1927 to 1978, she would write in both Spanish and English newspapers. Uh, she wrote up ads, she wrote letters to the editors. Uh, there was a very important newspaper in Texas called La Prensa from 1913 to 1960. It was actually the equivalent uh, of the New York Times for its time period. It was a, a, a wonderful newspaper that might have been 20 or 30 pages. They had correspondence throughout Latin America and in Europe. Uh, and so she wrote for La Prensa when they were pressing issues. She also wrote for English newspapers, especially uh, after the 60s, the McGallan Monitor, the Harlingen Star, the Brownsville Herald, uh, and different op-eds. Uh, she also, during the war, was an anti-fascist against fascism, both uh, in France and Italy. So uh, we call her a public intellectual. By that, we're referring to somebody who is a critical uh, commentator and is able to uh, uh, address serious critical issues, uh, but can do so uh, and reach an audience that uh, appeals to a broader audience and is trying to engage uh, the audience as, as interested and intelligent uh, citizens or residents. So we, we definitely would call her a public intellectual. Usually when we talk about someone who's an intellectual, we're talking about, about people who are college educated. But again, for her time, she really was the equivalent of somebody who was college educated in her respective community. I should also mention that when she was a senior citizen, uh, about 75 years old, that she actually um, uh, wrote a book. And her book that she wrote was a biography of the major founder of the LULAC organization. Alonso Perales, who was from Texas, uh, who lived from around 1898 to 1960 and died uh, while he was in his late 50s or early 60s. And she realized that many years had gone by, at least almost 20 years had gone by, 15, 20 years, and no one had written a biography or a book about him. So she decided to do that. Uh, she was his co-activist. They were friends, they were colleagues. There were comrades and the struggle for Mexican American civil rights. Um, so she did that. that. That's another example of her important work as a writer. Nonetheless, she did have what we would call gendered ambivalence. And again, this wasn't just the fact that she was not uh, feeling so strongly about herself. And again, I think all writers have questions and doubts about themselves, but nonetheless, we see some patterns. For example, we see that sometimes she writes in third person, sometimes she uses pseudonyms, sometimes she uses different variations of her name, whether it's Mrs. A. Sloss Vento or Mrs. Vento or Avela Sloss, different names. Uh, also, perhaps most importantly, throughout her life, really we see her giving very little credit to herself. And again, uh, amongst uh, people who study uh, uh, women writers, uh, or, or maybe even women in history, we could say that often women do not credit themselves. Uh, still, we also recognize that, and she recognized that there were barriers and reasons for, for sometimes not revealing who you are, okay? And again, not only did she write the letters to the editor, the op-eds, the books, correspondence to political leaders. She also wrote US presidents and she wrote presidents in Mexico. Okay, and let me read to you what she wrote to President Truman in 1952. And she's explained to him why he's perhaps not hearing much from 
the Mexican community in Texas. And she says, the reason you probably cannot hear from many of our people is because many of us are under the master's domination economically and to a few politically. Consequently, many of our people are not free to sign their name, nor do they have freedom of the press or freedom of speech. And so, <laughs> again, this is a very unusual. Uh, I want everyone to think about how often have any of you, have any of us, written to a president of the United States? How often have we written to a governor? How often have we even written to a local official? Okay, and she did that. And again, this is before the day of the computer. This is the day before uh, texts that are easy to do. Uh, but she, again, wrote these letters and she preserved uh, her letters. Uh, and I might say that, uh, let me give a little bit of background as to how I'm connected to her. And of course, you can ask uh, many questions later. Um, in 1978, was when I was a sophomore, for the very first time, I was able to take a Mexican-American history class. And again, uh, those of us who are older know that in the before the 1980s or so, or maybe even later, we really did not see Hispanic people in our textbooks, maybe a little bit in New Mexico, but in most of the places throughout the, the US, we hardly saw ourselves. So then when I took my first Chicano history class, I was very excited and I actually started to become a young historian. Uh, our professor actually had us write a 20 page uh, original research paper as a sophomore in college. And I actually uh, did that. I still have that paper. I had a hundred and something footnotes. So very early on, I was kind of a history nerd and really became a young historian. I wrote a senior honors thesis. But when I was doing my research on the founding of LULAC, because that was the topic I was studying, uh, there was a professor on campus uh, named, or, named Dr. Arnoldo Vento, and he was head of Mexican American Studies. And he told me, he says, you know, my mother actually was a friend of Alonso Perales, the main founder of LULAC, and uh, uh, she has papers and she's still alive and you should talk to her. So he arranged for me to meet her and talk to her. And I actually used some of her archives for my senior honors thesis. Um, and then she was already uh, uh, another woman at that time. And I went off to school uh, in California at UCLA and uh, I lost contact with her. She was up in age. By the time I tried to interview her, she was not interested. And again, she never gave attention to herself anyway. Uh, so when she died in 1998, uh, uh, I was fortunate to uh, be invited to uh, speak about her in McAllen, Texas, uh, an event that her son had organized. But really, the years went by. And then finally, uh, about 10 years ago, there was a major history conference in Houston on, about Alonso Perales, the founder of LULAC. And again, she had written a book about him in the late 70s. Well, sure enough, now Perales' papers were finally in the library after Dying in 19, imagine, he died in 1960 and his papers were not available to the general public until about 2009 or so. Uh, so anyway, there is where I saw uh, much correspondence between the two. And then I contacted her son. He was uh, still in Austin, retired. And I suggested that we put a little pamphlet together of some of her writings. Uh, what I did not know is that he had all her papers, that she had preserved uh, many papers, many writings, and therefore he said, you know, come and let's uh, work on this. And so we developed, we, we started to work on a book together. It didn't work out, uh, but he ended, he ended up writing a book, which includes many of her writings. And then mine came out two years later from the University of Texas Press. Um, so anyway, so that is my personal connection to Adela Sloss. Um, I also wanted to talk about her as a Democrat. Again, capital D. Uh, again, what we do know from her correspondence, from her archive, is that uh, she actively supported a number of presidential candidates. And we don't have that much archives uh, by Hispanic women that will show, oh, this woman was for... 
Eisenhower, this former and was for Hoover, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we do have her letters and she supported uh, uh, Franklin Delano uh, Roosevelt, Truman, uh, President Kennedy, LBJ, and President Carter. And again, uh, only about 10% of Americans ever write a public official. And again, she wrote all of these folks. Uh, we also have documentation that shows her very key role in the 1948 Senate race in Texas. And this is one where she actually worked against Lloyd Benson, who she saw as a slave to agricultural agribusiness in South Texas. Um, we also know that in the 1940s, uh, she was president and likely a founder of something called uh, the Citizens Political Club in the McAllen area. And they were registering voters, uh, getting people involved. And again, I had mentioned she was also active in supporting the Raza Unida. And again, she's an older woman during the Chicano movement, but she still manages to write op-eds and letters and correspondence uh, to political activists. And again, she also is of transnational importance, as I mentioned, because she writes several Mexican presidents, Miguel Alemán, Adolfo uh, Ruiz Cortines, uh, and again, mostly about the Bracero program, the exploitation of workers over here, and the fact that she thinks that the United States should help Mexico with machinery and seeds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I would say that uh, I'll go ahead and end there, but I want to uh, say one, a couple of things first. Uh, I want to read a quote by Dolores Huerta, who actually is from Dixon here in New Mexico. And Dolores Huerta was talking about why women should give themselves credit. Uh, too many people, uh, women especially, do not give credit uh, to themselves, and sometimes they are lost in history because of that. And this is what Dolores Huerta had to say. She said, you must always stand up for the work you do so that other people don't steal your thunder. It's hard for women to do this sometimes because we can be so accommodating. We want to be helpful. We want to be supportive of others. But, but when it comes to the ideas we have, the good decisions we make, we have to be sure to take credit. Even if people think we're being egotistical, I always say to women, it is important that we honor ourselves in our work. And I think that's a very important thought for us during uh, the month of women's history. Uh, and uh, of course, passing also International uh, Women's Day as well. Um, I would like to conclude, uh, and I would like us to think about Adela Slavs Bentor as an early example of a wise Latina woman. And again, that phrase came from uh, Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, she has not been our only wise Latina woman. We need to know more about these early role models. Um, also, I would say that Adela Slavs Bentor uh, if any of you are familiar with some of the folklore and history of Mexico, in Mexico during the Mexican Revolution, 1910 to 1930, uh, women rebels were some, sometimes referred to as La Velita, uh, the, the little Adele, uh, but a woman who was supportive of the revolution. We could definitely call Adela Slas Benta the Adelita of Texas. Uh, finally, I want us to think about her uh, not so much as a LULAC member, because she really was not a member of LULAC. Instead, she was still in a league of her own. There is nobody like Adela Slas Bento in New Mexico, in California, uh, anybody else in Texas that had such a sustained uh, civil rights record uh, from the 1920s all the way till 1990. Her very last political act was a letter of congratulations to Governor Ann Richards. And Ann Richards um, responded, I, I tried to find the, the Adela Slavs Bento letter in the Governor uh, Richards uh, uh, papers, I couldn't find it, but I did find the response. And uh, Governor uh, Richards thanked Adela Slavs Bento uh, for uh, recognizing her, uh, Governor Richard's vision. And I sat there and I laughed and I thought, this was not Governor Richard's vision. 
this was the vision of Adela Slosvin. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if folks have comments or questions, uh, I'm happy to, to take them. Um, thank you so much. And I see some hands raised. So um, Dr. Hurtado, your hand is raised. Would you like to ask a question to Dr. Orozco? Okay. Um, Dr. Duarte? I also see your hand raised. So if you would like to ask a question to Dr. Orozco. Uh, okay, I, thank you. Go okay. ahead. Thank you. thank you, Diana. Uh, thank you, Dr. Orozco. That was a great talk. Uh, I appreciate you walking us through that journey of uh, your character and uh, putting her into the bigger picture for all of us to understand her relevance. Thank you. Um, maybe if you can talk to us briefly about uh, how difficult or how easy it was for you to know this subject firsthand in the, um, the interview process, the, the, the things that uh, we do as, as historians. Uh, is it easier when you know the subject? Is it harder? when you just have to go through the documents. I don't know if you can speak to that. To, okay, to, yes, uh, yes. And, and as I mentioned, you know, I was fortunate because uh, I think there was one other academic that might have visited Aldela Sloss at her home. Uh, she's now deceased. Uh, but basically I'm the only person, uh, only uh, scholar in the United States that ever met her. Uh, and uh, again, I was fortunate that she had a significant body of archives that I used in my senior honors thesis and also in my dissertation and, and later book. Uh, my book is uh, No Mexicans, Women or Dogs Allowed, The Rise of the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement, which was published in 2009 from UT Press. Uh, but anyway, so I did not interview her at the time. You know, I was quite young uh, and I, ha I had no uh, classes in women's history when I was an undergrad. They were just barely starting that at UT Austin. Other schools already had women's history by the 70s, but UT Austin did not. So when I went to California, uh, UCLA, um, I studied with uh, Dr. Uh, Kitty, uh, Catherine Kishklar, who was a leading historian at the time. Uh, and I did have an interest in interviewing her, but by that time she was older. And again, she never wanted to give herself attention and credit. She always kept talking about the male leaders from decades past. Well, her book uh, that she published, uh, which was self-published, it probably cost her the equivalent of about $7,000 at the time. Okay, so she put, work in and she put money into what she believed in and it's a self-published book it didn't get much play anywhere uh, but uh, again uh, she wrote a little bit about herself but really she's a minor minor character in that book and really it's not until I saw all of her archives in her son's house you know about 10 years ago that I realized you know what this woman had an amazing lifetime of achievement and she is unknown to everybody in the United States. Uh, again, her book got so little play uh, and it was published around 1977, 1978. Uh, she, didn't, she was older. She didn't have a marketing machine behind her. Nobody paid attention. She was ignored also because she wasn't in a major city. Um, and so, her archives then became very, very important. And really it's her archives and not any interviews with her that we have. Um, there are, uh, there is one dissertation that also one, uh, I think there's one article and one dissertation uh, in part about her, uh, but really uh, this work is important because it utilizes her voice to her archives. Um, I had interviewed her son uh, about 10 years before she passed. Uh, so I got a little bit of information from the son. Uh, Dr. Vento is still with us and he could still be interviewed. There is still much more information or knowledge that could be had in learning about her. 
Do we have another question or comment? Uh, uh, somebody has asked about, is LULAC still active in New Mexico? And the, the response is yes. Okay, and LULAC uh, is a volunteer organization. Uh, it has um, been strong in a couple of cities and towns more so than, than others. Uh, but what many people may not realize, and I, I did write a paper about this. Uh, it was published around 1998. Uh, I wrote an article about LULAC in New Mexico. And LULAC uh, became the second major state that LULAC was in, New Mexico. And a num there's been about five or six national presidents from LULAC in the late 30s and 40s, including Dr. George I. Santos, who was from New Mexico, but ended up in Texas. Uh, so LULAC uh, was in Albuquerque at that time in the 30s and 40s, Albuquerque, Santa Fe. It's also been in Las Cruces. Uh, right now, I just joined uh, the council in Las Cruces. A new council has been formed in Albuquerque. It's been in Roswell. It's been very strong in places like Hurley and Silver City. Uh, comes and goes. Uh, again, it's a volunteer organization. Um, there are so many issues and, and also nowadays competing organizations, but yes, LULAC is still around uh, here in New Mexico. And, and throughout the United States, there's actually about a thousand councils. Okay, but it's a difficult time right now uh, because of the pandemic. I know so, uh, many councils have been impacted by that and hopefully they will survive. But again, LULAC survived. It was founded in nine, February, 1929. And the depression started <laughs> less than a year later and LULAC survived. Okay, LULAC survived in Texas in the 1930s and New Mexico really did save LULAC in a number of ways. They, they published many of the newsletters in the late 30s and 40s. Uh, so national conventions have been, were held here in the early 40s. Uh, national conventions have been held in Albuquerque in the 1990s. And actually this year's conference was supposed to be in Albuquerque, but I, because of the pandemic, I think it's, uh, it's on hold, I believe, maybe online. There is Another question, I don't know if you can see it from Dr. Gold. How do you feel these days from the position of the topic of your today's discussion? Okay, well, I, I, I'm not quite sure. That's a real broad question, uh, but obviously there are still many, many civil rights issues, um, voting rights, and, uh, immigrant, immigrant rights, especially the, the DACA students. Uh, we need those DACA students. I actually am, the daughter of some uh, of somebody who would have been considered a DACA student of the 1920s. Um, my mother was a graduate of high school as well in 1938. Um, so I'm a beneficiary uh, of the fact that she came in the 1920s as a child with her parents. Um, so we still have so many issues today. Uh, most of those issues have changed but have not gone away. So. Uh, if folks are, uh, LULAC, of course, is open to anybody. It doesn't matter what your ethnic or racial background is. Uh, it's also very strong in Puerto Rico. Um, so uh, there's a million issues still. Um, another question from Rukutso is, in your view, how are these acts of marginalization like in the present day compared to the mid late 1900s, especially when it comes to the girl, child, or Latino descendant. Okay, and I think you're I think you're asking about how have things changed for Hispanic women or across time. Um, and again, uh, you know, uh, the segregated, the racially segregated schools, the poverty, the lack of support from parents uh, to allow uh, girls uh, to leave their communities to go to college. You know, once in a while, I still run across that where uh, somebody will say, well, my, my parents or my dad doesn't think I should go to college or they want me to stay home so that I can help care for the family, et cetera, et cetera. So we still have some of those problems. Uh, but nonetheless, this is a completely different era. This is an era 
uh, where women of power are appreciated. I hope I can say that <laughs> and, and be honest and truthful about that. Uh, we have so many more role models, so many more opportunities. Uh, thank goodness for the Pell Grant in the late 70s, which allowed for financial aid. Thank goodness for community college, which gives so many people, especially rural people, an opportunity to go to school despite having to work maybe eight to five, despite having children. Uh, there are scholarships that are available for uh, underprivileged, underadvantaged people, particularly women. Uh, so I hope people take uh, advantage of all the opportunities that were not there for previous generations. We just have so much uh, since really since the 1970s. It, we have much, much more than we've ever had before. And Dr. Caldwell say thank you. I recall that LULAC was very strong in California. New Dr. Sklar. At UCLA, she was a wonderful teacher. I didn't know you had studied. Yes, that. yes. And, and let me say that uh, again, uh, California uh, had the first chapter in Sacramento in the late 30s. But really, uh, you know, they had a, a major desegregation case there in Orange County, the Mendes case, uh, which desegregated the California school. And really, it's not that far back because my husband was actually, who's older than me, uh, my husband in Carpinteria, uh, his first year of school, the year before his relatives went to the segregated Mexican schools. Okay, so he missed the segregated Mexican school by one year. Uh, California in the last 10, 20 years has seen a resurgence in the strength of LULAC. Uh, and again, LULAC chapters come and go. Uh, but the racism and the poverty and the exploitation have not ended. And therefore we will continue to see LULAC survive and maybe not thrive, but LULAC will always survive. Uh, I see Ryan has uh, his hand raised. Would you like to ask a question, Ryan? Okay. Okay. Uh, some of the comments, Dr. Gold, thank you very much. This explains it. Best of luck to you and your family. Um, let, let me also say something about New Mexico, again, because most of our uh, audience and folks here won't know too much about uh, New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico, because of the fact that it was a Hispanic majority population up until the 1940s, did not have some of the the extreme racism that Texas had. Uh, but you know what? We did have separate schools in Alamo Gordo. We had separate schools in Roswell, uh, Hurley, Silver City area. So more so Eastern, uh, Eastern section, Southern section. But there would have also been hotels and motels that any person, regardless of class, even somebody like Dr. Uh, George I. Sanchez could have not have slept at if he was traveling uh, between Texas and New Mexico. Uh, we do have uh, women, uh, 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 Hispanic women that have played a very prominent role. Um, uh, Adelino Otero Warren, I think didn't get enough attention uh, for being a major uh, suffrage le leader in, uh, for women in the 1910s here in New Mexico. Aurora Lucero White wrote about language rights. Language rights have always been very important in New Mexico. Uh, and then in, in more recent times, we have people like Elizabeth Martinez, a very prominent writer from New Mexico. Uh, we also have uh, Enriqueta Vasquez, who wrote for uh, Northern New Mexico newspapers in the 70s and 80s. So there are some very uh, important women of achievement here in New Mexico. Uh, uh, but again, we need more forms. We need more, more, more focus on those women here in New Mexico. This, despite the, the, the modern day folks that, that you and I might know about here in the state. Um, another question is uh, besides LOLAC, LOLAC, can you briefly speak about the role of other activists in New Mexico, such as Reyes Tijerina? Okay, yes, Reyes Tijerina, uh, was a Tejano. I want everyone to know that. <laughs> uh, he was from Texas. Uh, he had uh, a, a, a very, uh, uh, an he was an outstanding orator. Uh, 
Uh, and because he was educated, an outstanding orator, and, and was a preacher, uh, he was able to magnetize and, and inspire uh, Hispanos here in New Mexico who had lost their land grants. Uh, again, most of the land grants had been lost by 19, 1900. Uh, and unfortunately, he used uh, some tactics of violence. Uh, a, a couple of people were killed. Uh, he was imprisoned. Uh, but I think he played a major role in inspiring uh, New Mexicans. There were over a thousand people in the Alianza that he worked with here in New Mexico, a very important leader here in the state. We now have a couple of biographies of him. Um, he was not uh, tied to LULAG, but he did uh, attend the Poor People's March. Uh, really, it's the same causes. Uh, people have different organizations, but basically the same causes. Um, and I see, a, I see a question about uh, the letters that Adela Slas Bento wrote to officials. Uh, again, uh, these letters were usually one or two pages. Um, they were somewhat spotty. Again, like maybe one or two letters to Truman, uh, one to Carter, those type of things. Uh, but she kept uh, uh, imploring the need to give attention to the Mexican descent community. Okay, and really, when you think about it, I would say that up until recent times, you know, it wasn't that long ago, maybe less than 10 years ago, that we had somebody like Julian Castro that was uh, at a national democratic uh, convention that got television play. But, you know, besides him, the years before that, we had very, very spotty representation uh, of people who were uh, able to voice uh, national Hispanic issues. Uh, Adela Slas Vento did not have that platform, uh, but she did what she could. Uh, again, we should mention that she was married. Uh, at first, she was unmarried till the mid 30s, but in the late 30s, she married. She had a number of miscarriages, then she had two children, and then she started working as a jail matron, which also was a very male environment. So most of what she did was in a very, very male environment. And that's where I talk about the idea of homosociality um, in the book. Uh, but she was able to do most of what she did in her home, writing on paper with her pen and using a postage stamp. And again, uh, collectively, uh, her record is unmatched. Um, individually, it, it seems like it didn't matter what she did, nothing hardly changed. Uh, but really it's the spirit of her collective acts of resistance uh, that are so important in, in understanding the times that she lived in. Uh -huh. Catherine asked, what really sparked your passion for studying Latin women's history? Um, well, I, again, I, I, I was at UT Austin in the late 70s. I was fortunate to have uh, attended a very good school. And also uh, the Chicano movement was, I saw the very last part of that. And I was a participant of that, I would say from 1976 to 78. Uh, by that time, there was a woman in Texas named Marta Cortera, uh, who was a librarian, but had written two books, uh, The Chicana Feminist and another one called Diosa y Embra about Chicanas. And that was the first time I had ever seen anything written by us about us uh, as a Hispanic woman. Uh, so I would say I was a beneficiary of that. Uh, and that, uh, uh, again, uh, my entrance into the university coincided with the Chicano movement. Uh, I also was part of an emerging Chicana movement, especially in, in the academy with other uh, graduate students. We were very few, but we actually had a national network and we would know, oh, you know what? There's one political scientist here. And I remember at the time thinking, okay, well, there's three uh, uh, Hispanic women political scientists in the U.S. And we used to count ourselves as Hispanic historians who are women. We said, okay, well, now there's 10 of us, okay? And, and now I'm not sure what our numbers are, but I wouldn't doubt now if there's 50. But it's not 500 and it's not 5,000. 
Okay, so our numbers are still few and we recognize that we are unique because uh, we are still uh, subordinated in many ways. And then Cheyenne asked, did any of the leaders write back? How much influence did she have on national scale? Yeah, uh, again, there might have been a couple of uh, cursory letters in response, uh, but uh, she was not a policy changer. Uh, she did not change opinions. Uh, but again, uh, I, I don't know how many of us can, can change the opinions of our politicians. Uh, but, but again, and, and she didn't have a national platform, okay? Uh, so, so she did pretty well in her time, I would say, because uh, I, I would say probably when she, where she grew up, she was probably known quite well. Uh, but even so, when a book came out uh, on uh, 100, uh, women leaders of the valley, she was not included as a, as a writer. Uh, maybe because of her age or the people who put it together did not know her from decades past. And it's cumulative, all of her stuff together that shows how much she really did matter and what a wise Latina that she was. Any other questions before we come to our closing? Well, I, I sure appreciate having this opportunity to speak both to Portales and, and Redoso, and uh, I, I'm available for any groups or, or whatever that uh, folks might need me for. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be a teacher here at a &MU for more than 20 years already. Well, I think we could not have chosen um, two more accomplished women uh, to commemorate uh, Women's History Month at Eastern, then Adela uh, and uh, Dr. Orozco, two very wise women. Thank, Thank you very much. Orozco. So I wanted to wish everybody good luck on midterms. And if you get spring break, rest a little bit. Um, and then our next, please fill out the survey. And our next event is going to be March 23rd, and it's going to be Women of Blues uh, concert. And you will get your, um, the email and then please register, um, you know, through the Zoom link. So I appreciate all our faithful attendees. Um, it's been a pleasure meeting you, Dr. Orozco. Likewise. A few min minutes that we had, and I'm going to speak some Spanish. Como no. <laughs> I have okay. a, a ver si, si ENMU Portales pueden organizar más uh, viajes a España. Ah, Porque sí. nosotros aquí no conocemos. <laughs> and I, basically, I, I said, I hope ENMU Portales can organize more trips to Spain because the people of New Mexico do not know Spain for the most part. And I'm glad President Caldwell is in attendance. So maybe he, she heard that. <laughs> so, um, so have a great afternoon and evening, all of you. And I can wait to see you soon. Thank you, Dr. Orozco. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody Bye, for being here. Everybody.